Want more positivity in your life? Subscribe, turn on notifications, follow us, and you know, all that techie stuff. We'd love to hear from you. Comment, share, or give us a thumbs up. We are grateful to have you hanging out with us at Matt Logan Speaks. So I have a guest with me today that she claims to me that she is the 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 most unbelievable and crazy important and has incredible stories. <laughs> <laughs> Betsy Singer. Oh, that is so not true. I think the word I used for myself when talking to you was I'm not as interesting as you think I might be. I I know, but I didn't want to steal that from you. <laughs> We had to well, build it up. Well, here we and are. And get, get, you, get you to smile big for the camera. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because when I do speaking engagements and I'll see a still photographer right in front of me, I'll be blah, 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 and I'll see that and I'm like, oh. <laughs> because otherwise, do you know how many pictures there are of me out there going? Yeah, those awkward. In, I hate in, those. I know, and they always so use the camera, worst I'm going to pose. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll screenshot that one. Thank you. Yes. Um. <laughs> You, you did say that you weren't very interesting, and I don't agree with that because you... And just for the record, I, this, a thought that just came to mind, I asked you to come on the podcast way before you got to talk to the Vice President of the United States. Oh, I know. Okay, so just no, so no, we're no. Clear. I know that had nothing to do with anything. And the thing is, is that my husband made such a big deal out of that. And I'm like, God, what? <laughs> he's, it's not like he's the president. Right. I mean, I like him very much. He's a very nice man, Mr. Pence. But I'm like, it's not that big of a deal. And the way it took off on social media, I'm like, why do people care about that? Yeah. I mean, I could interview interesting people. Mr. Pence is interesting, but like yeah. really, really I- interesting. Sure. Now, this is going to be out on the internet. And if, <laughs> if you <laughs> oh, should see this, it, I'm like, I, I don't mean any disrespect. But I was surprised at why people thought that that one was such a big deal and congratulating me on that. Do you think it's because they it's so hard to uh, get like time with someone that's that busy? You, you would think, but now as we're closer to the election, yeah, and here we are, about a little over a month away from the 2020 general election. Because once this goes out on the internet, this could yeah, be out be there like for a ex- long time, yeah, eighteen yeah. years from right. now. <laughs> um, that. As we're closer to it, uh, candidates are much more willing to talk to you. Sure. I've had requests in for Joe Biden, requests in for President Trump that I'm really glad didn't get uh, re- uh, that didn't get accepted this week. Yeah. I'm really glad I didn't get accepted didn't, to go to Duluth on Wednesday. Right. Did he have COVID then? Uh, they say that he got it. Uh, in Duluth? Well, that his aide got it in Duluth and then okay. gave it to him. Sure. That's sure. what... That's believe. the chain of events. That's what they think. Hmm. And so I interviewed the other day a reporter from Duluth uh, and asked him if he was concerned about that. Yeah. Being, I mean, I know you're not like right next to the president, but you're in a room, you think about it, and it comes out, most well-known person on this planet, our president, having COVID-19. And he, he goes, yeah, you don't want to really tell people that you're worried about it because then you seem like one of those fear-mongering kind of people. Mm. He goes, but yeah, you kind of can't help but think about it. But anyway. Do you, uh, with, you report on this, obviously. Do you, are you scared of COVID-19? Personally? You know, and I thought about that this morning because I figured that that would be something that would come up because it's so political. If you're afraid of it, you're a liberal. If you're not afraid of it, you're a conservative. Um, I'm in the middle. I And politically speaking, put all that aside, um, I don't want to get it because yeah. it affects people differently. For sure. Some people, and it's rare, uh, under the age of 50 for you to die from it. But one of the women who I talked to from Austin who had it, um, her whole family tested positive. When she tested positive, she ended up in the ICU damn near dying from it. Mm. And her family got a cold. And she didn't have any underlying health conditions, 48 years old. And I'm just like, gosh, it's so funny how it affects people differently. And you know what I've research i'm a kind of a research geek and not that i dig super deep but i want to look for what's true and what's propaganda and all these other things I'm careful right? with what you google Ex- <laughs> well no exactly and it's not necessarily what i google but um and some of it is of course but i'll 
I'll talk to people that I know or um, Scott Jensen. I asked him the question. I think that was off camera, but so vitamin D seems to be a huge factor in this. That's all we're hearing about within the last 24 hours since the president was diagnosed. But that's been going on. There was a, another, uh, you ever heard of Joe Rogan? Uh-huh. He's not very well known or anything. Okay, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm so I listened. So when I when I did Google it, this was a two or three months ago. He had a doctor on there that was talking about that. That she did a lot of research in um, like 83, 84 percent of the people who had died were vitamin D deficient in all this stuff. What's interesting to me is, and I've seen that too. The vitamin D things coming out a lot in the last twenty four hours. Mm-hmm. It's been going on for months. Right. I talked to Scott Jensen in July. And he told you about it. And he said same thing. And zinc mm -hmm. um, is another big factor. And see, and when we start getting a cold in our house, we will load up on zinc, the Zycam, the Airborne, the and all of that. And it helps. Um, something that I found interesting when I was interviewing people as COVID was just ramping up. So back in like April-ish, there's a data analysis expert in Mankato. He sat on a board for Mayo Clinic and he was referred to me by one of our former congressmen mm. who said, Betsy, you really should talk to this guy. What he has found is really interesting. Okay, so I researched the guy, and I'm looking at his papers and the stuff that he's put out, and I'm like, well, one, he's credible, um, and two, what he was talking about was why kids aren't getting severe symptoms mm -hmm. and why kids aren't dying from this. And what he found in studying all the other countries dealing with COVID, that more of the third world countries who don't do immunizations – have higher death rates and kids getting much more sick. So he started looking at different immunizations. Okay, which immunizations is uh, are is this country doing more so in our country and and population wise and is it affecting certain ethnicities different? So he did he did an extensive amount of research within like a month as COVID was starting to come out in March and then in April when I talked to him, what he found was this is his theory. He believes that the MMR vaccine, measles, mumps, and rubella, there's something mm. in that vaccine that was keeping kids from it, from getting COVID very bad, uh, badly, and th it, that they weren't dying from it. Okay, that made sense, and it was great. He has all kinds of contacts. He hit up politicians. He hit up Mayo. He hit up uh, Johns Hopkins, Cleveland Clinic, every major medical facility with researchers that he could, he would tell this to. He told a friend who works in uh, at Oxford in England, and Oxford was the only one that really took interest. Oxford was the one who first came out saying that they were the ones in their first human trials of a vaccine. So this man contacted me, and he's like, isn't that interesting? Betsy, they could be onto something. And I said, oh, you're not going to get the credit. He goes, I don't care, as long as we get a vaccine. Mm -hmm. I spoke to a researcher recently, and we were talking about kids and why they don't get it. And his thinking is, is that, you know, the receptors on our cells, those, the spikes, yeah. as adults, they're developed. And so it latches mm. on to the virus. And kids don't have the spike receptors as developed, so it doesn't latch on. That's his theory. Sure. So I'm not really sure. Bottom line is, regardless of whatever the theory is or the actual reason, uh, kids aren't getting it as awful. And thank God. Think yeah, if this were killing absolutely. kids. Right. As parents, we would. I would lock down my house. I wouldn't let my kids out of the house. And, and, and that would make sense with the information that we have now because if, if we knew it was killing kids, right, we would lock it down. But the information that we have now, and they still want all these lockdowns, is what's confusing to me. I, I mean, you know, I'm concerned about my parents. You probably are about yours, yeah. you know, things like that. Yeah, we wouldn't they, see my parents for two months when this started because we were afraid of it. Right, mm -hmm. yeah. And I didn't see my grandson and then had a, a new granddaughter born in June. And now in June, we had more information. So, you know, I got to see her a couple of days after she was born and stuff. But so that was, a it, it, it is, it, that fear at the moment of, 
conception, call it, of the virus and when it was coming out makes sense. But now what are we, eight, nine months into it from when we found out in January, February, especially of what it, what it is and started to, starting to spread at that time. Why are we, are, so you're not really afraid of it anymore. Is that what you're saying? I think so. Yeah. I'm not, because we, we still live our lives. Yeah, I was with you at the beginning. I was, yeah. af I was afraid of it at the beginning mm -hmm. too. Yeah. yeah, and I think most Americans are, are like us in yeah. that, yep, we were afraid. We found more information. I can't stay locked up in my house. I know people who are still locked up. Yeah, I do too. Um, and, and I'm not talking long-term care facilities. I know. That one just makes me madder than I'll get oh. out. Oh, I don't Where's want the accountability any, for that. And and I look for answers too. And then we get told these nice answers. I'm like, okay, are they answers? They are. They're like, yep, we're doing these steps and we're doing this process. That's and I'm not like, an answer. That's what's happening now. Yeah, but that's the answer that they're giving yeah. when I say, "What are you doing right now?" Yeah, right now. Sure, that mm -hmm. makes sense. And so then we come back to it and we revisit it. Well, they say, well, we've done this, this, and this. And then people who have their uh, parents in these facilities come back and say, no, that's not true. And at that point, I'm like, okay, I'm a journalist and I'm following up on this, but I'm also following up on 800 other things. Yeah. And it's like, I'm not the uh, with the MDH. I know I have a responsibility, but I also have a job where I'm following, I've got to host debates and we've still got these virtual things, um, the banquets, these galas, these fundraisers that I, we're still doing. I'm raising a family. I worry about my sick um, parents. And there are, they're not sick, well, they've been sick, um, but they're older. And so all these things factor in and people will get really crazy mad at me like, you didn't follow up on this. I'm like, <laughs> You see my plate? Yeah. Yeah, it falls to the ground a lot. And I drop these balls, and that that happens. I'm not as afraid of COVID as I used to be, just like most people. Um, I try to put information out. I ask a lot of questions because I don't know the answers. And when I share with you, like now, um, what I'm hearing through these interviews, people will get crazy mad that we're even putting it out there, that we're even talking about it. I'm like, since when can we not talk about stuff, even if it's not true? We're, we're, I'm trying to figure out if it is or not. This brings into a good segue. Why is it, uh, um, I think this statistic is a year or two old now, but it says it's six to seven times more likely that people will view something that's not true and they know it's not true than they will what they know is true. Give me an example of that. Let me give an example. Um, let's use Trump's taxes, right? Clickbait paid $750 in taxes, okay? Well, in their own story, they say he paid in one of the years was 1 million in taxes and the next year was 4.2 million. Right in their own story. So the $750 isn't even true. Mm -hmm. But guess what? They didn't nobody read the article. Right, and that will happen in my line of work all the time. All the time. So it's six to seven times more likely that people will just see that's what's not true and won't even think about. I, I mean, come on, seven hundred and fifty dollars. I mean, really. But I don't hear his side disputing it. And when you do, and when facts do come out, people will give you that. But and and. But I think when you dispute it. Um, he doesn't, t to me, I don't think he needs to dispute it because in the same article it said that he had a, you know, he he paid $1 million in whatever year it was, 2016 or 17, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. And the other year was 4.2, right in their own article when they said he only paid $750. Well, he did pay in their own article $5.2 million in taxes. But we're sitting there watching the debate. And I had an issue with their first debate because I was waiting to hear more of what you're talking about. Yeah. There was uh, a million, four million paid, but that's over here. And if you're going to get technical, that 750 is different because, and there's all these logistics behind it and there's not enough time to get into it and blah, blah, blah. Which is true. Yeah. And, and so... It comes down to people hear what they want to hear, yes. um, and we don't look enough at uh, 
the whole picture, but that's for sure. I mean, I can put out a, a, an interview. People will read the headline, never listen to the interview, yeah. and, and rake me over the coals right. just after reading that headline. Yeah. You know, and judge me for it. Yeah. Um, and so that's what happens a lot with, with politics. And it's hard. I just had a very good conversation. My best friend is liberal. I'm conservative. Um, but she considers herself more fiscally conservative. So when it comes to money, she's more, mm -hmm. you know. And so as we're talking about, the, she's one of the folks really mad at the $750 in taxes. And I said, okay, how is that different when we go back to um, President Obama's birth certificate? Sure. Can it be proven and there's the headline that people latch on to. I know the issues are very different, but it comes down to the bottom line. You're going to believe what you want to believe. You hear what you want to hear because it fits what you want to see about a certain person. Confirmation bias at its, uh, I mean, prime time right there. Confirmation bias. And we look you, at you, facts. We try to it, bring out facts. We try to bring out the entire story. And... Uh, people still will just grab onto that headline. And, and being a local news agency, and I say news, not media, because that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to produce the news. We're trying See, to give information, right. period. C CNN, Fox, uh, MSNBC, there's a chart, I guess, out there, and I haven't seen it, but someone told me about it like a couple days ago. Apparently, there's a chart out there of, of bias, like the different medias that are biased and yeah. things like that. And I don't know, Have you have you heard about that? No. Okay, I'm gonna have to find it. You sh you should look it up too. But you know, CNN, um, they talk about uh, apparently. And I, again, I haven't seen this, so we're just having a conversation. We're not. People Don't rake us fact, over the coals, right? Please. P this is a podcast. Uh -huh. This is about conversation. This <laughs> perspective. <isn't>, yes. <laughs> so, um, but I guess like CNN, obviously, it said uh, liberal bias and Fox conservative bias and things like that. So they're trying to point to those directions, which makes sense. That's what makes them money, right? Mm -hmm. um, but what was interesting apparently on this chart was is that even some of the non-biased large media outlets are, are biased. They're showing bias when they're not supposed to. Being a local news agency, you've had me on your program, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, in fact, I think you've interviewed me a few times mm -hmm. over the years. Mm -hmm. And it's always been very straightforward, very open and honest. And the and why is how do you navigate that? Okay, because how, I know. When, when, but when you're up against all the other nonsense. Okay, well, because I know my own bias. Mm. I work 10 times harder to be as fair as possible yeah. because I know what I believe and I will vote pro-life every time, yeah. no matter what. If that makes me one of those Bible-thumping Christian haters, label me what you will. I will vote pro-life. I will. Yeah. Now, there are candidates who say that they're pro-life and I don't know if they are or not, but I'm going to vote pro-life over somebody who is pro-choice. That is a core value of mine. Yeah. I have to stand at the end of my days before my maker, and I have to answer to my maker. Yeah. And no boss, no viewer, not even my own family will be standing there in judgment of me. I will stand before God, and he, there, he will say, well done my good and faithful servant, or he will say, I don't even know your name. So when I, when it comes down to my responsibility of voting, it will always be on pro-life. And then I look at the other issues, but that one is the one that I cannot, I cannot waver on. And putting that out there so boldly, people tell me all the time not to. And like, that is who I am. Which poses the question, why can certain, and let's just take pro-choice, why can they scream from the highest mountaintop and that be okay in someone who's pro-life screams from the mountaintop and not be okay? Why is that such a difference? Because we, and it's, that's true. Because we have, we have evolved into a kind of society that is will take and twist anything. 
I, I, we will take and twist anything. I have been the subject of uh, um, my reputation, my who I am has been twisted into something very hateful, and it's not true. I don't hate anyone. I don't look at people who believe in pro-choice as awful. That is yeah, yeah, yeah. their right. But do not come and attack me for my right to speak what I believe. And I'm not going to come after you. Uh, and I'm not going to twist anything. I want to have a conversation. And people can believe what you believe. People believe what I believe. But I'm not trying to make you believe anything. Just listen to the sides. Right. And that's... That is how I try not to be biased because personally, I have my own biases that I try so hard to make sure we get the other side. Let me tell you, it's a lot easier for me to get the conservative side because they'll say yes, not because they believe I'm conservative. They're, they will just say yes when I ask to interview them. The same time I ask conservatives to interview with me, I make sure that we're also asking liberals to talk as well so that we get both sides. And something else people don't understand, I am not a team of one. We have yeah, an entire right. news team with producers, executive producer, assignment editor, news director, we have reporters, we've got a whole team. And while I put out an idea of something we should cover or an interview, they're putting out their own ideas and we cover it comes down to what my producers want not what betsy wants yeah people don't get that so they want to attack me because they see me on the news asking questions and doing these interviews don't realize that i've tried to get six people from the other side to talk and they've said no and then um i've got producers who will write scripts that are biased that i'm like oh god i can't say that Bring it back to the middle. And I work very hard to bring it back to the middle, even though I personally lean right. I think you really nailed it when you said you know your bias. So you know yourself. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was in The Matrix, right? With <laughs> Neo was with the Oracle. You ever see that movie? Never many, saw many, it. Many, but, I'm a but, huge movie freak. So, But guys in this business will always refer to that when what? they say Betsy as long as you know your bias and then they'll bring up the matrix and I'm like yeah I just didn't yeah, see it yeah it doesn't, but, doesn't but men have seen it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah but so he walks into the room and meets the oracle for the first time and and there's a sign in latin there and I, I don't know the latin phrase but it it means that um know thyself mm -hmm. and i think there's it's so often what what i see it's so often that people don't know their own bias but the people that do know their own bias are open to communicating with other people. That's why with That's my, why you can have a liberal friend. She's my best friend, and we have the best conversations because she helps me understand why she thinks the way she yeah. does. I don't look at her and think, you're wrong. I look at exactly. her and think, hmm, I don't see it that way, but I can see why you do. Mm -hmm. And that's why Dr. Senator Scott Jensen is one of my favorite interviews because yeah. he's gentle and respectful. You don't see things his way. He is not going to disrespect you or be unkind to you. He'll listen, and that's what I want. My dad's that way, and I want to be that way. I want to listen to you, even if I don't see it your way. That doesn't even mean that I'm disagreeing with you, because I'm not here to argue. I'm here to say, hmm, that's an interesting way to look at it. Now, people who believe the same way I do get really mad at me. They're like, why didn't you ask this, 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 and this? Because that would have made that person defensive. Mm-hmm. I am interviewing yeah. people to give them a chance to give their side. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good because that's so important. Empathetic listening, right? Mm -hmm. And which turns into the proper questions. You have to listen to understand so that you can know what to ask rather than make them defensive. Because what happens then? No communication. And if you can pull the emotion, if you can get to the why behind the mm -hmm. why, behind the why of that and get right down to the core of somebody and get to their emotion as to why they believe it. And a lot of times with more liberal-minded uh, thinkers, I, I get just almost to that core 
and then they shut me down. There's something hurtful there. I'm not saying that with everyone. I'm not speaking in general terms with people I have spoken to. Once I say, well, why do you believe this? And then they'll say, well, because, and I'm like, okay, why? And I'll go back a few steps into where they started with their belief system. And we all have hurts and brokenness and whatever that that shape who we are today and why we, we believe what we believe and why we want to believe certain things and there our beliefs come out of our experiences our experiences have a lot of hurts to them and that's where and i'm not saying liberals i'm saying all of us yeah we form who we are or we are formed into who we are based on our past experiences and if you can't um verbalize the past whether that be a good experience or a bad experience a hurt or a reward or whatever else then you don't know yourself Mm -hmm. and i think that's probably where you come to when you start digging deeper into those questions with them it probably comes to a place where they're like wait i know myself up to this point but i can't go any further Mm -hmm. because i haven't tried to understand myself over here right Mm-hmm. You know, what I, what I pray for my boys, I have a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old, and what I pray, I pray so much about God protect them. That comes out of my own fear. God and I are still working on that piece of it. Um, but what I pray more so now is not only to give them discernment and wisdom, but Lord, help them look in the mirror and see what I see. Help them see truth in what you created them to be. And I don't mean for this to turn into a faith-based talk, but that's what I pray for my boys. Because if we could look at ourselves in the mirror and see what we were created to be and who we are, the value that we have inside of us, I think there'd be a lot less hate. It's true. That's really the only religion, if you want to label it that, um, that you don't have to do this or do that or be this way or help this person or anything else to have that that value right to be all it is 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 our our identity in Christ i tell is where we get the where we get that value and i tell the boys you are going to hear because they'll come home from school telling me things that they're learning and i'm like oh sweetie sit down just because a teacher believes this doesn't make it true There is one truth. And this is where people will disagree with me, and this is where things get really mucky. There is truth, and there are what things that people believe, and they'll call it their truth. There is one truth, and that's what I teach at home. Yeah. Their truth is, that's an interesting phrase, because that has, when I That's an oxymoron. It's an extreme oxymoron, and we're really paying the price for that nowadays, big time. And when I grew up, that didn't exist. Look, whether you were a faith-based person or not, it wasn't my truth and your truth and their truth and his truth and whatever you want to be called's truth, right? And I it don't is. mean that as an offense. And here, here, let me say it like this. Jesus, if you remove the religious piece of it, okay, let's just completely remove that. His teaching... Okay, his teaching completely taught people to not be biased against a race. A hundred percent. His teaching taught people to say, this is the moral value. You can not do this. Your morals don't have to line up with this, but this is the consequence, right? There's no other religion that's like that. All the other religions are do this and do that, and this is, you know, on this level of heaven and that, and and all these other things that go on. So you remove the religious aspect. And if if we walked the path that Jesus laid out non religiously, we would all understand each other because the teaching wasn't religious. And the tolerance. The heaven, the death is what was religious with Jesus. And, and and the tolerance that we would have for one another totally would it, be a, a, a beautiful thing. It, but but then people say that Jesus didn't tolerate. He wasn't a tolerant person. Okay, then I ask the question, what did Jesus not tolerate? Self-righteousness. That's it. People who thought they were right 
all of the time and that there was no room for anything else. That's the only thing he wasn't tolerant of. Otherwise, he loved. He said, I'm going to, Zacchaeus, let's go eat. <laughs> yeah. You know, the woman at the well. She was confused on, on all kinds of reasons that, why are you talking to me because of race? That was a huge thing. Yeah. If you, so what I try to talk to about people, well, let's not bring religion into it. Okay, let's not. <laughs> What about what Jesus? But taught? let me talk to you about Jesus. <laughs> and let's let's take the let's take the heaven piece. Let's take the death part of it out. He taught us how to be. Yeah. Plain and simple. That's my philosophy. I'm a believer. I believe Jesus, and He died on the cross and rose from the grave, and 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 all that. And because I believe that, that I'll go to heaven, and and those things. I do believe that. But if you remove those things, He taught us really well. You know, yeah. he really did. When he taught us, like you said, tolerance. He completely taught us tolerance. When I talk about my dad, who's eighty-six, I say and I describe him as the closest thing to Jesus on earth. Yeah, because he is kind, he is tolerant, and he is gentle, and he is ho so humble and kind. And and he's not my biological father. He came into my life when I was two. And he's the only father that I've known because I didn't know my biological father. And what I, I just, being the youngest of seven, I just am so thankful to God that I have had that kind of example my whole life. And for people who don't have that, um, it, when people have good dads, 90% uh, uh, of the time, uh, they turn out to be good people. And I'm not saying I'm a good person because I have a good dad. Um, my dad is good. And, and to have that example, that's exactly what I mean, right? Like that's exactly, that's the, he's, he's walking that, he's a walking example of what Jesus taught. Um, and then because he can walk as that example, he can then share his faith, Yeah. right? And everything comes down to, and he is so conservative. And he loves President Trump. And I ask him questions. I'm like, Dad, um, President Trump just says some things that yeah. are really, you know, same thing that I'll even uh, plenty of Trump voters will say, but he says stuff that just, oh. And I'm like, you know, Dad, so how can you defend when we've got someone in the office who, you know, says things that are unkind to other people, about other people, right, you know, in in front in front of your, their face and it's so hard to watch and he said because he's honest and i'm like well yeah you can be honest dad like you and not be hurtful to someone yeah but it's funny because my dad can as kind and as gentle as he is he he just like so many other people and i'm bringing this back to politics because that's where we are in society yeah. with with this division um and I do see where President Trump really stirs that pot. Um, but my dad's like so many other people who say, we're just glad to finally have someone who speaks their mind. And I'm like, well, okay. <laughs> yeah, he definitely speaks his mind. But it, at some points, it's like, come on, man, shut up. <laughs> I'm with you on that. <laughs> yeah, right? you know. I would have to say I don't know him, so I can't like him or dislike him, right? Right. But what I can say is, is I like his policies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think that he's made some great policy changes. You don't have a lot like of that. liberal podcast viewers, do you? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know, but probably not. But here's the thing: you would know if you did. I, that's they, true. You I do. Well, we them. talked about that off camera. I do get. I do get some trolling. Not a lot because I'm not very popular. Thank God. <laughs> but here, we also talked about off camera. I have reached out to like the same way you have to both parties, and Republicans are the only ones who have responded. Yeah, I think that says a lot about how they treat individual people okay so if a democrat that i've reached out to doesn't respond to me even say no they haven't even said no they just haven't responded and there's been republicans that said no sorry and that's okay but they responded mm -hmm. so to me that means they care about a person i'm a person right and if 
I'm not saying that Democrats don't care about people, but I think that what it shows me is that the Republicans will take the time for the one person. And the Democrats haven't seemed to do that in my perspective. That is my perspective. And it gets to be mine. And I don't, I, don't, I, <laughs> so, I have nothing more to say or right. add to that because but, I don't want to get beat up over it. No, but it's been very interesting to me. Um, not that I expect Actually, not to expect anybody to say yes, but they can't say yes if I don't ask. Right. I do, however, appreciate when someone says no, because then they've taken that half a second to look at it and say it's not going to work. I see. Right? I wish I could look at it that way. I got a no the other day. And I'm like, well, geez, that was rude. You could have taken five minutes just yeah. to talk to me. And they flat out say, hey, you're getting more nope. than I get because you're popular, <laughs> no, right? not and popular. <laughs> no, it's because people can, sadly, people look at um, how big of a platform do you have? That's that's kind of my point. What can uh, I get out of it and, as a politician by going on your podcast or by going on Betsy's newscast? Yes. And there are other media outlets who will be able to get more yeses than me because they're more popular. Yes, which then says what they think about individual that's people. That's absolutely right. And that I, is I mean, I, I don't want to be that. No, but it's I mean, I do want to be bold. Yeah, it is both sides, mm -hmm. absolutely. But the percentage, if you look at, let, let's say it was, let's just use an easy number and say it was 10 each that I reached out to. You know, I got I got some yeses and some nos, and then I got 10 nothings. Um, what is that? On the left. On the left. You have to be clear because people on are like, oh, what do you mean? Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, okay, well, what is that going to do for me then? As a person, I'm probably not going to vote for a Democrat. <laughs> probably not going to anyway. <laughs> Let's just say that. <laughs> and and because, if they know that going in, then they've got nothing to gain or lose by ignoring you. But they definitely lost by ignoring me. And who knows? Your podcast could blow up it, huge it, and it they'd might, be begging that, you. Right. And we talked about that off camera too. And I'm not doing it to be big or popular i'm doing it because i i have a mission and a goal to help people um very 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 few people helped me after my daughter died with the speaking side of it there's a couple but um i want to help people get through a lot of those different difficulties in their life and that's why i do it i don't need to have a powerful guest like you to fulfill my mission <laughs> right but thank you for being here for thanks sure. for calling be powerful <laughs> but um but you know what i'm saying it's like i think that i hope that i can stay on mission all of the time and that's really we all idea. get sidetracked we do and when you start to help me be accountable and you to don't my know mission, it just help, don't be I'm, hard on yourself on on record let's uh, help me help me stick to you know my mission i uh, will help me be accountable i will i will know. i think that it's important i think that having conversations very very important and for people who don't agree that's okay just listen yeah i didn't know if i'd agree with you on anything <laughs> I was pretty sure we'd agree because I've interviewed you and I liked True. you from the very get go. And then when tragedy you. hit, um, you know, I, I when I talk to people and when I talk to you, God, I was afraid for you coming in after DJ died because I knew you before. Yeah. And then having you come in, I'm like, like most people, were afraid to talk to somebody who's gone through such loss because. We don't know what to say. Are we going to say something stupid? You know, my foot ends up in my mouth all the time. Not only that, I didn't want to cry. Yeah. And how selfish is that? But having interviewed you and, and, and knowing you, when you reached out to me to do this, I'm like, well, God, it's about time I talk to you again. It's been a really long time. How yeah. come it's been so long? Um, I will do whatever I can at any time to help. Uh, and I say that to a lot of people, and I end up saying yes to a lot of things my best friend says you should probably say no to because then I let people down, and I don't want to let you down. 
Well, I really, really appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, your time, I understand, is extremely valuable, so I appreciate that as well. Do we want to keep going or should we wrap up and, like, let's do this again sometime? You tell me. My let's answer. do this again sometime. Okay. This well. was fun. We're, let's do this after the election. Oh. Can we? That'd be so great. Because we'll be on the other like, side of this. I, I feel like no matter who wins, there's just going to be a lot less pressure with anything in life, right? There will be. I but hope. Yeah. I just, I just keep praying that this election just doesn't destroy us. Look I've at been researching. Yeah, what exactly. Has happened? I've been researching um, why there's such a divide, and I, I'm not really there yet. But this is Jonathan Haidt. I think I'm saying his name right. He's a liberal. Um, I don't really believe almost anything that in his belief system. However, he is a psychologist or a psychology researcher or something. I'm probably getting it very wrong, so I apologize. So look him up. <laughs> but he's written some books. And he actually, uh, Coddling of the American Mind, it talks about really where our colleges went way wrong. And they track it. And it's, it, it's extremely powerful. Hmm. Because what I've tried to do was learn the liberal side of it mm -hmm. but the true side of it right not what we see in the news and not on some of those different things but really the truth of that liberal side and they unpack that very well he also wrote a book called the righteous mind i'm not through that book yet but that's also extremely powerful because it talks about in there um and i'm not going to say the exact phrase right but it, it's basically they're trying to understand why um, religion and politics divide people on the left and the right and the psychology behind it. It's been extremely powerful. Because it goes to the core values of who we are. It does. That's why. And um, what's been very interesting is the core values to people who would be considered on the right or conservative, um, essentially we don't sway on those values. In the liberal side of it, they do i've never There's, i've not heard heard it put into perspective like that and and so it's not that their core values change hmm. whether they're and, and this is what he did he unpacked all these things and I, i'm probably saying the wrong words but this is this is my words mm -hmm. but they unpacked that and and really looked at it and even talked about like the reagan election and stuff in there and why someone like reagan being that conservative at that time got into office and all those things it's very interesting but essentially you know those those core values move and change you should uh there uh, from a liberal standpoint and when we're done as you're yeah. speaking i'm thinking of people who you could interview yeah who you could talk to on this podcast who will f say yes i believe and who do not think the way you think and see that's how we learn for, that's to right me. that's right i want to understand people yeah they don't when have I, to think like me well, I, you when know. i first started becoming friends with my liberal best friend she's like well you know i'm liberal i'm like well you know i'm conservative <laughs> and she goes should we try to find a jew <laughs> and I said, yeah. Right. I, I said, I always tell That's people good. I'm half Jewish, you know, because I totally Cause, believe in the Old Testament. Yes, for but, sure. But when I tell yes. that to a Jewish rabbi, he gets all excited and then he realizes what I mean. Yeah. And then he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. That's a good place to end. Yeah, yeah, until next time. Thanks for being here. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks for asking. Yeah.